I'm uh, Doug Armstrong, and I'm pleased to uh, uh, have you join us for the Regenerative Medicine Investment Hypothesis Panel. Uh, what is it, and how does it differ based on different investors? We have, you know, the uh, capital market sessions are always the exciting ones at, uh, at scientific symposiums. We all understand that, and we have a great panel that are going to continue that, that tradition. I thought I'd just go over a little bit of how we're going to run the panel today. Um, we're going to open up just by giving you a little self-introduction to uh, each of the panel members and, and how they might fit into the topic at hand. Uh, we're going to go into a few discussion points. Uh, we sure welcome any questions uh, from any of you as we go. Let's just uh, deal with, with, with that as, as we're in process. Uh, but we are going to stop and leave some time at the end uh, for any uh, particular questions that, that anybody has. Um, so to uh, just open that up a little bit, I'll introduce myself and why I happen to get the, uh, the honor of, of moderating this session. I know a, a number of you. I was uh, actually involved in this uh, space at a early, very early time. I was involved in spinning a company called Astrum Biosciences out of the University of Michigan in 1991 and served as its uh, chief executive officer and chairman of the board for 15 years and through uh, a lot of real interesting periods in the early stages of, of developing stem cell as well as immunotherapy in the 1990s and early 2000s, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, we're involved in a number of things, including a, a successful phase three trial that actually uh, we got close to coming to market with, but we lost our indication. And I often wonder, as we're going to talk about today a little bit and looking at um, what are some of the value propositions that companies need to have, if that uh, successful phase three trial had been able to actually move into uh, being a successful commercialized product and, and how different this space might have been. But you can always wonder about what it was and, and we can just take those experiences and, and try to, to leverage them to help uh, the industry as it exists today. I went on and uh, served on the uh, boards of a, of a few other companies, including a couple cell therapy companies. I ended up uh, taking another company public as well on the London Stock Exchange. So again, not only a US IPO experience, but a London IPO experience. And uh, after that adventure, um, ended up moving over to the dark side, as we say, and, and joined the investment banking space to try to work and help uh, emerging growth companies, and, and particularly companies in the uh, regenerative medicine uh, area with their capital markets needs. And uh, that has actually evolved into my now being the Chief Business Officer of Dawson James Securities. So I um, uh, will uh, moderate the panel and do the best I can. I'm sure I'll throw in a few words maybe along the way of my own experiences. But why don't we uh, start with introducing the panel. Let me just run through everybody's names, then we'll do individual introductions. On the far left, we have Ed Lamphere, uh, the CEO of Sangamo uh, Biosciences. Next to him, Fariba Godzian, um, the managing uh, member of DAFNA Capital Management. Next to her, uh, Steve Brozak, the CEO of WBB Securities. And uh, a guest panelist uh, who's not on your agenda, who's able to fill in today, um, is uh, Andrea Hunt, the Vice President of Cellular Therapies for Baxter Healthcare. And finally, we have Paul Kim, the Managing Director of POSCO Global Strategic Fund and the CEO of uh, POCASTEM. So with that, um, why don't we just start with each of you giving a little bit of your background. And I think that will really help set the stage for the agenda that we're having today. Ed, why don't you begin? Happy to. Um, Edward Lanfear, Sangamo Biosciences. I've been at Sangamo for coming up on uh, 20 years. Uh, before that, I was involved in uh, several uh, biotech startups, but the one previous to Sangamo was also a gene therapy company. So I've been in the cell and autologous gene therapy space for about 20 years. Um, beginning of my career was in consulting and then uh, at Eli Lilly in the strategic business planning group at Lilly. Thank you. Fariba? Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, I started the, my education on the uh, engineering side, chemical engineer, and uh, continued to do uh, my PhD in biomedical engineering. And uh, I worked in the pharma biotech industry and 
uh, both on the research side and in business development. And then I went to Wall Street in, uh, was it, uh, 1994. Uh, and uh, gene therapy and cell therapy was one of the areas that at the time I, uh, I covered uh, companies like Cell Genesis, Weichel and so forth. And uh, later on, uh, uh, I joined, uh, uh, I started it with Bush Morgan here in Los Angeles and uh, with uh, Hancock and then uh, with uh, Lehman Brothers. And my last cell site position was with Roth Capital. And uh, after that, for the last 10 years, uh, I have been uh, managing uh, Daphna Capital. Uh, we are a, a, a long short fund based in Los Angeles and we cover biotech and medical devices. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, run, uh, I'm the president and managing director of WEV Securities. We're an independent broker dealer that's uh, bi coastal, although I don't know right now about the East Coast and how it's handling. Uh, what I'm going to go back to, but um, basically uh, we placed about a billion dollars worth of uh, securities in the healthcare field over the last decade. Uh, we run investment banking focused specifically on biotechnology and uh, under the small firm exception we also do research which is in the biotech, especially pharma, pharma and uh, med device space. And so I've uh, been doing it now for roughly a quarter century which uh, is probably way too long, but uh, we've had a chance to see just about everything uh, from the micro caps becoming you know, multi-billion dollar companies and to be able to say, I remember these people when they were just poor millionaires. Um, the realities are that uh, looking at it, you know, you have to understand, as you well do, that um, the opportunities are there. It's just that they're not uniform and they come in different ways than you expect. So um, that's the perspective that I'll be bringing today. Thank you. Andrea? I'm Andrea Hunt with Baxter Healthcare. I've been with Baxter for more than 20 years, um, working on a variety of innovation initiatives under our Chief Scientific and Innovation Officer. Um, so have uh, had responsibility of uh, running sort of our internal incubator initiatives within Baxter and uh, that led me to my current position which is managing our cellular therapies business uh, within Baxter. We're involved today in um, clinical trials in phase three in the cardiac area and also in the vascular side as well but uh, I'll speak probably more from uh, just what we see within Baxter and, and how we look at uh, bringing in new initiatives and those kinds of things. I hope I can bring that to the panel. Okay. Paul? Uh, my name is Paul Kim. I'm with uh, POSCO Group. POSCO uh, is a $45 billion steel conglomerate that's based in Korea. Uh, may have a very, probably the most unique investor in biotech space, but uh, uh, truth of the matter is actually POSCO Fund started here in San Diego about 10 years ago. Uh, I was one of the founders of the fund. At that time, the fund uh, invested broadly across the different areas in biotech, but uh, starting last year, uh, we made a strategic focus in, in regenerative medicine, and uh, the reason for that, I, th I think I can give it to you in, in a little bit more detail later on, but um, the, we, <coughs> we have a, an equity investment uh, entity, which is the, the venture capital fund uh, that POSCO is the 100% uh, LP in, but we also have a uh, company called POGA STEM, which is uh, it's the fund's dedicated development entity, uh, where, where we invest in a company and then we take that the company's product or an asset and develop it uh, in, in, uh, in with through POGA STEM, leveraging a lot of the, the clinical uh, infrastructure and the advances in, in regulatory development uh, in Korea. Korea uh, has really become a, a leader in this, the stem cell therapy uh, industry, having been the first country to commercialize uh, stem cell products uh, in the world. They actually have uh, three products, uh, one of which uh, uh, that company, I think, is actually is here in the audience today, a company called Pharmacel. Um, so we'd like to leverage a lot of uh, what the Korean industry in the stem cell has achieved over the last uh, several years and uh, leverage that with our uh, investment uh, tools that we have at POSCO. Okay, thank you, Paul. I might add, um, I'm actually the president of an uh, uh, emerging growth fund as well, Oxford Capital. So if we look at the, um, the panel, we have uh, three funds. Uh, represented um, 
current CEO and old CEO. Uh, it was, uh, and we all know all CEOs are always out there looking for I'm money. A, I'm the only one here looking for money. <laughs> you guys, I'm, that, that's great. In, in case you don't know about where funds come from, we're all looking for money. So, <laughs> so um, and then uh, uh, investment banking uh, with Steve, and uh, uh, and then uh, the industry perspective uh, from what um, um, companies such as Baxter uh, looks to see in um, in investing and being involved with new technologies. Well, one thing I've learned from over the years um, of being involved from both the CEO side and um, particularly from the public side as well as now on the banking side is a keen understanding that uh, achieving shareholder value is as much a capital markets decision as it is a technology decision. And I think um, back in the origins of regenerative medicine and stem cells, um, we all used to get away with, you know, what's your company? We have stem cells, we have stem cell technology. Okay, great. And that generated excitement by itself. But, you know, that as a value proposition doesn't work anymore. Um, you need to really be able to lay out a number of things, and that's what we're going to talk about today a little bit in different ways, and what that value proposition really needs to be to look to generate value. Because if we don't generate value, we're not going to raise money, and investors aren't going to invest in this space. And I think careful attention to that um, uh, of, of matching up a capital market strategy and plan with an operational plan and a technology development plan is absolutely critical uh, for this space as it is for all emerging growth companies. So that's what I'd open this up a little bit and I think the first topic um, around that is going to be just to see what do we think uh, amongst the panel the investment climate is for money coming into the regenerative medicine space. So why don't we start um, uh, with the funds and maybe talking a little bit if we can divide it up thinking about what that might be for early stage companies, mid stage companies and some later stage companies because one of the nice things is Steve I know I'm going to steal your bullet a little bit give you credit but you'll talk about is this industry has moved where we have some late stage companies. We have companies that are now in late stage trials and um, so that, uh, that investment uh, uh, question is, is a bit different for, uh, for these different companies. But um, why don't we start with um, uh, um, Fariba Yu and just a little bit of, of what you think the climate is for investment in this space. Uh, I guess just, just to make sure, when you talk regenerative medicine, you're more talking about stem cell companies as opposed to also other cell therapy or well, because let's say dandrion is a cell therapy, but not stem cell, and obviously they're already on the market, so kind of... Well, for, for me, I think the critical question is, uh, I would say emerging growth cell-based therapies. Um, I don't think uh, there's too much at this conference represented by um, um, chemical wound healing products and things of that nature. So maybe uh, cell-based regenerative medicine, cell-based therapies. So let's say the endurance type would be included that be fine. in that sense. Okay, okay, no, that's fine. I mean, y y you know, I can talk a bit about our experience and well, what also I think maybe the Let's start with what your main line is, what you really l are mostly involved with, and then maybe comment oh, on the okay. other areas. I mean, at Daphna Capital, we are involved practically across all sectors within biotech and medical devices. So we do invest um, in terms of diseases, you know, we invest in cancer, cardiovascular, uh, uh, metabolic, you know, all different diseases. And also in terms of technology, we look at practically all, all type of uh, technologies uh, from onco antibody to small molecule and so forth. So, so in that sense, we are focused all on healthcare and uh, there is no area of biotech that we are excluding per se. And throughout the years, we have invested in some cell therapy companies and some specifically stem cell companies. Uh, uh, let's say Pluristem is one company we have, we have had investments. Uh, why? Uh, why, why, did you, why did you invest in them? Um, I mean, I can give the specific example. Okay, Pluristem, I guess, uh, uh, partly because uh, the, the sourcing of the, of the stem cell seemed interesting from placenta, so that's one, one thing, and it was, uh, it was allogeneic, so that's another, uh, you know, we can get into, of course, you know, we have uh, companies like Astrom, that are doing the, um, the autologous uh, versus allogeneic. 
So, um, so those were some of the things that we looked at and uh, uh, they had some early stage data that sounded very interesting. But I think as a whole, I have to say that we are still, from a buy side perspective, I think we are still looking at the stem cell and cell therapy business a bit as a black hole, uh, a, a, a bit as a black box still. A lot of parameters that you have for what I call regular drugs, that you can judge, judge the drugs by that, you don't have it when you come to cell therapy. And uh, many of the markers and biomarkers that we can judge by, we don't see it in cell therapy yet. Um, let's say one good example is dendron. I mean, obviously dendron, they showed survival benefit, they are on the market. But I think the same way that funds were struggling with that uh, lack of uh, tangible things that you can measure that uh, uh, clearly show the efficacy of the, of the treatment, also in the marketplace, I think those, uh, those difficulties are still exist. And even though we have survival benefit, because physicians say, for example, you don't see PSA uh, decline or you don't see um, the, the specific uh, progression effect, you see just survival effect. And they cannot see uh, which patient is actually benefiting from treatment or not. So, so I think those are, those are one thing that the, um, if there is any way to kind of try to make the, the, some markers that clearly show the, how the treatment is actually affecting uh, the modality of the disease, those would be very helpful. And I think uh, along... So is, is, is that the analyst in you coming out that's looking at that detail, or is that um, the, the fund manager? Then, and, and well, it's how, true. Uh, They're both voting one. So how, so how do you see other fund managers? Because I know when you invest, you're investing with other funds. How are they... What are, they, what are you saying to each other about this space and, and the interest to invest? I mean, clearly it's, a, it's an intriguing space. The, the, there is huge amount of possibilities that we see in this space, but we still are trying to wrap our hands around it. I think, I think going back to the companies, uh, we haven't seen many real well-controlled trials in this space. Astrum, to, to its credit, actually uh, had, has a well-controlled trial uh, in uh, critical limb ischemia. We have seen one or two companies having randomized data in, um, in cardiovascular side. But even that, sometimes the trials are too small, the variabilities are too high. So even with a positive trial, I think that we are still not 100% sure is the treatment clearly working or, uh, I mean, we don't have phase three data as yet. Let's say Mesoblast has, I believe, phase two data in cardiac side and uh, uh, Osiris, I believe, had some phase two data, but we still need more meat. That's so um, would, you, would you say your, your fund and your interest and maybe the others around you um, are looking more at the later stage companies rather than the early stage? You know, even the later stage are not very late stage, so... Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, hold those thoughts and come back in here. Paul, why don't we go to you as, as being involved in, I think, some early stage investing as well as uh, mid and late. Oh, I mean, we have been, I mean, you know, in terms of investing into regional medicine companies, uh, we just made a change about a year ago. Um, and I think, you know, I guess the most important thing about us probably is that um, uh, the company that we, we like to invest uh, is, has some strategic, uh, some synergistic benefits and strategic interest to POSCO, which is, uh, is a non-healthcare company, obviously. It's a, it's a commodity company that has built its uh, business you know, in, in, in steel production. But I think what we like to look at is uh, companies that we think uh, can benefit from our involvement coming from that exact sort of non-traditional healthcare space, meaning that we don't necessarily look at things as the way that the traditional investors here in the U.S. look at it. Uh, we like to leverage uh, the, some of the capabilities that the POSCO and uh, the clinical infrastructure and uh, development uh, resources that we have in Korea. Um, so I, I think from that perspective, we want to look at companies not only, although we, we use the same metrics, but 
we won't make a decision on whether we invest in an early stage company or a later stage company. It's just primarily based on what they exhibit, but what we see as a something that strategically fits with your strategically fits and what we can do with that asset, what we can do with that technology. Um, so that's the piece I think that uh, when we made the decision to be a regenerative medicine company, we needed to have a, a advantage, uh, not only just you know quote quote investing in regenerative medicine company per se, but how we you know, increase the value of that investment through what we do in Korea, for example. So that's the primary difference there. So, so what are those, uh, the, the, the key areas of interest in regenerative medicine that, you've, that you're um, prioritizing? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a nascent stage for us, obviously, POSCO wanting to get into biotech space and, and building a business in regenerative medicine. So, uh, you know, we don't really have a, uh, you know, whether it's cardiovascular or you know neuro neurospace, uh, any kind of a therapeutic uh, area per se, I think the big thing for us, uh, you know, going into building a business for us is, uh, do we have the scalability for you know this forty-five, fifty billion dollar company to grow the business into a multi-billion dollar company? And that's based on uh, the kind of partners that we like to attract, kind of the investment companies that we like to invest. Do they have the the reach and the, the growth potential for that company to, uh, for POSCO to partner with and grow together. Um, so I think that's the sort of the bigger uh, kind of things that we ask. Uh, so you can, you're, 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 sounds like you can adapt that priority to what looks to be working and successful. Yeah, and uh, we like to make money at it too. Uh, yeah. that's, that's, uh, that's without a question. So I think for that to be feasible, uh, commercially feasible, uh, and something where we can, you know, add value, uh, you know, from a different angle than what the, this company has asked of the investor traditionally, when, which is primarily uh, in equity, um, that's the kind of angle that we like to play. Okay. Okay. Um, Andrea, what, uh, maybe from the uh, the Baxter perspective, although I know that. Um, yeah, you're involved with the technology that, that sort of goes back, as we were talking earlier, it goes back to the 90s along with uh, the early Astrum days of CD34 selection and CD34 technologies that are now re-emerging and being reapplied under your direction. But um, is that a focus or is the company looking to also, um, well, I guess, why is that a focus? Where do you see that value? Why is the company interested to do that? And where else do you think you might want to be involved? It certainly is a focus for Baxter as we're involved, um, you know, in funding the phase three trials and looking at other indications as well. So, um, you know, I think the challenges of... You can even maybe just summarize what those phase three trials are, where that area of focus is right now. I'm sure. We um, have initiated our first uh, phase three trial in uh, refractory angina, and uh, that trial is enrolling in the United States. We have a lot of preclinical data and um, phase one and phase two controlled trials as well that you know have published data along those lines, which really led Baxter to making the decision to move forward with uh, the phase three trials. Um, you know, as we look at you know sort of assessing whether or not to have moved forward in this whole space over the last almost ten years now. Um, the same sort of uh, parameters that we look for in, in bringing new stuff are, are applied. And certainly as we assess anything, the regulatory risk along with the technical risk have always been paramount. I think what has emerged as the third leg of um, you know, us looking at what to bring in is market access. And certainly as a company, that has become much more of a focus and a priority even in the early stage um, investments that uh, we look at at Baxter. So I know I'm going to diverge a little, but uh, at least from the venture world, you know, the venture world is declining in terms of investment dollars being applied. And I think a lot of the um, thought process behind that is, is this market access risk has just elevated the overall risk of any of these emerging new growth opportunities. And so, you know, the risky nature and how long it's going to take to kind of be able to predict, you know, 10 years from inception or even longer than that of how the market is going to pay for these therapies has um, made 
I think these early stage investments much more risky to people like Baxter. Now, for Baxter, I mean, a global <coughs> company who has reach in, you know, 100 countries and ability to manufacture, the ability for uh, Salesforce, et cetera, you know, our, our core strength is probably uh, taking opportunities that are almost ready to go to market and being able to scale and, and um, deploy them globally uh, in terms of channel and, and access. So, you know, there are some things where we'll look at opportunities earlier stage, and that probably, you know, to, to be fair, are areas where we already have franchises built up, hemophilia, um, spaces like that where we have something to really defend. And so we will invest earlier in areas that we've got franchises already. Um, new emerging spaces like cell therapies, you know, the challenge even internally for Baxter is to try to talk about the model and, and why we think this will be successful and we have to go through uh, the same hurdles of, of going through really um, highlighting the technical and, and regulatory and certainly market access, access risk as, as we move forward. I don't know if that Doug gets to your answer, but. Did, did you like your answer? <laughs> I thought my answer was okay. I, I thought it was great. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Ed. Shameless. What are you seeing out there? <laughs> yes. That's yes. what yes. I've, I've learned. Being a parent, you learn, you know, you learn to stay. That's right. <laughs> but you never get in trouble that way. Never. What can I do for you? What do you What are you seeing out there? What are you seeing out there in the way of capital and where that capital is coming from and what it's what it wants to see in you before it's going to invest in it. It's hard. It's it's really hard. I mean, I, I look in this room and and it's um, you know to be to use your, the shameless uh, uh, effort here. This room is full of some of the hardest working, risk taking, you know, entrepreneurs in the world. I mean, and, and, and this goes to your point, right? You compare, as you are, you know, we should, in the possible investments you can make, you know, across biotech. And you go, well, shoot, cell therapy. You know, what we call mature is hardly mature by your standards. And, and so these guys have decided to, to bet their careers in a space that's really, really tough. So, you know, I, I applaud everybody here. Uh, that's my shameless plug. But it's um, true. I mean, you look out true. here, there's, it's true. there's, there's it's great, great experience, great, experience, great work, well, great diligence. Minutes, so I'm moving on. Uh, so that I, I'll just take off on the venture start and I'll work my way up. I mean, to say venture's tough, it's, it's not tough, it's obliterated. Um, if you think about what funds, you talk about you guys out raising money, you know, what, where those monies are coming from. I mean, I've had people in the venture community tell me that their, their LPs are saying to them, if you want to go in devices, fine. If you want to go in healthcare services, fine. We'll come back into the fund. If you're going to invest in biotech, let alone, again, gene and cell therapy, I mean, they don't, we're not going to come in, right? So, they, you know, they've done the experiment. 30 years, what's been the return? Not worth going there. And, and there's a lot of funds that just don't have that capital. Now, there are strategic investors, fantastic. Pharmaceutical strategic investors. But then you get to the point of sort of, after you get, if you raise some money, you know, what do you have and, and so on. And it, and it gets harder, because you, you say, okay, I'm gonna put together a book, right? And, and, and see if you're telling me, you know, nobody wants to be the first money in. They want to be the last money in because if they don't get sufficient capital to get to the next milestone, then it's wasted money and they're going to get b diluted down to hell on the next round. So it's very, very hard. And even, you know, especially, you know, in, a, in emerging risk areas, as a public company, I can tell you, you don't get paid. You don't get paid for value creation until you either have, you know, unequivocal phase 2B, phase 3 ready, post phase 2 FDA, meeting data and or, but and, a corporate partner to pay for the phase three plus a pipeline behind that. So it's it's very, very tough right now. And if you look at it from the sort of source of capital coming up uh, at the venture side, there's not anything coming up uh, underneath it. So it's for me, it's, it's, a, it's a very tough environment out there. And yeah, we can come back and talk about you know, where there are pockets, right? What you could do. Where I mean, in California, we, we've got we've, you know, the greatest thing in the world for this space. We have CIRM, right? And we've got other uh, groups. We've had funding from JDRF. We've had funding from Michael J. Fox. We've had funding from a bunch of those sorts of things. We can talk about that. But as an industry, and then if you take the subsector of, of even more difficult cell and gene therapy, it's a very tough financing climate. So do, do you think that alternative, you're, I think what you're saying uh, then is alternative sources of capital are really key for this industry and 
Yeah, but they're, they're, they're absolutely key, they're absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient by five right, sure. orders of magnitude to sustain the industry, to sustain the business, to really have the kind of growth that we all believe is supported by the science. There's a huge disconnect. Okay, well, let's come, let's come back to that. Let's bring Steve into this a little bit. And Steve, you're, uh, Steve, from being out there and, and advising, helping companies uh, in the space, what, what are you seeing? Well, I run a company, so I have to deal with all the hats, uh, the analyst hat, the sales hat, the banking hat, and the investing hat. And everybody in this room knows what I, I'm going to say now, but I don't think you're basically looking at it in a one- and two-step approach. The first step is real science is completely random. That's the only reality that I've ever seen. Anybody that goes out there and tells me they know what they're doing, starting with a phase one all the way through the clinical approval, you know, is on some other planet. And the other one is that the capital markets are efficient, okay? You know, the reality is the first person through the door always gets shot. That's it. It's the sixth or seventh person that basically has come through that, you know, uh, everyone else has absorbed the shrapnel for that person. And why can I say this? Okay, I spent 22 years in the Marine Corps, so I'll use some, you know, props. This is a, a prospectus here going back to 1996 of a venerable, you know, stem cell company that had the names Kleiner Perkins, Venrock, CW Ventures, Domain, Oxford, Aetna, Bioinvestments Limited. Um, on the other side, we had J.P. Morgan, Montgomery, Solomon, Alex Brown, Lehman, Morgan Stanley, and Punk Ziegel. How many of the banks are left, and you know how many of the biotech investors are really left? Okay. At the same time, I had a piece with Time Magazine, and they obviously, you know, put uh, you, you can't really see it all the way back. And trust me, it's there. Stem cells and Nature went out there and threw in their scientific blessings on everything else. So what happened? Obviously, we're still waiting. Now. The irony is, and one of the statements I was going to use is, we're in the best of times, we're in the worst of times. Why are we in the best of times? Because, to quote Thomas Alvatis, and we figured out just about every way it cannot work. Now, we're starting to see ways it does work. And guess what? We're getting calls from really sophisticated people saying, okay, give me your best idea. How do I put $50 million to work? What kind of a structure will do that? What do I need to do to monopolize this market? Because if there was ever an industry that could be monopolized, it is this one. Now, you know, you say to yourself, I made a very bold statement saying science is unscientific. <clears throat> Back in 1986, I was working at Dean Witter. We brought a company called Celgene Public. It was not an oncology company. It was a chiral company spun off by Hoxelanes. And I just came from the East Coast, so I'm a little bit rattled here on how I'm going to get back, but I have one of the prospectuses showing that DLJ, another name, did the deal. And frankly, um, it was a down round. Oh, we were involved. And then there was another one after that in 1997 when they decided that they were going to go out there and market a drug, thalidomide, which you're all familiar with. Now, why would a chiral chemical company market a drug that no one knew what the application was for? Because 13 other pharmaceutical companies said, you think I'm going to go out there and risk my franchise on selling this poison? Well, guess what? They did risk their franchise. And this, this deal wasn't the last deal. There were two more deals after that. It, uh, the company went from 100 million down to 50 million. And now it's at what? $34 billion. And oh, by the way, they're probably one of the largest stem cell companies in the world that people don't really know has a significant and robust stem cell franchise. So uh, what I can tell you is we get pinged by a lot of very smart people asking us the right questions now, which tells me who's the first company through the door? Okay, we'll see. Where is the commercial application? How much money? And then these smart people are basically saying, how much money do I have to have to double down if I have to? Now, um, we're involved in just about every transaction in the stem cell space we choose to be involved in. I'm not going to tell you it's easy. You all know that. It's not. But I am going to tell you, for those that understand where they see opportunity, where they see true data, where they see something that is totally counterintuitive and has a clinical application to it, that's the opportunity. Now, what do we need and what can I say and what will I close on? 
about uh, two years ago, we were sitting down and we were in a panel and we were discussing how the industry needs to have some kind of external consolidating force. So one of the government folks said, well, what do you think? And I said, they've got to have an anchor tenant. And the United States government said, OK, so how do we do it? So we wrote a journal. Uh, we wrote it in a journal um, for biodefense, bio biosecurity, saying the government had to go out there and act as that an anchor tenant for dual-use products. Now, I've written in peer-reviewed journals. Let me tell you something. This was the toughest peer-reviewed journal I've ever written for, because it was like sent back four or five times, and people were questioning this, questioning that. And I, I didn't even get a free copy, so I, I'm still a little bit angry about that. <laughs> but what happened? The government came in, and they said they'll start to write checks. When you start to see that kind of an anchor and say, OK, the government's starting to write checks, now you've got something that's different. And that's why we believe that this is now, if not, you know, when, if, right now. All right, so um, venture capital doesn't seem to be around. Typical late stage investing doesn't seem to be around for, th for this. So, so where are we as an industry? Where is the money going to come from? Yeah, I was caught by a... Um, a couple things uh, here and just think about venture capital not being there and what the reaction not of just this industry um, probably needs to, to be doing and is doing uh, but other emerging growth as well and and that's been um, getting public you know through reverse mergers or through these types of approaches and and um, you know we've been trying to look at is, is that really been successful or not and companies have been able to raise a little money but sometimes they just shot themselves in the foot they couldn't go any further but beyond that that money they they initially raised others have been able to you know really take that and leverage it going forward with um, with good investor interest is what are you seeing in, from the banking space which what is your feeling about that as an option for for companies to look at and then maybe we can talk or not talk about what it what it might take and free but what you think that might be as from an interest to invest in or how you viewed those types of structures reverse mergers coming in and, and becoming public well I guess you asked about the VC side you know what, what we see you got a lot of VCs that are basically saying they're tired of having to report to shareholders. You know, they don't want to talk about this anymore. They don't want to have to explain stuff, so they're winding stuff down. Then we get the other VC that says, look, if you can bail us out of this, we'll put in 30 million and, you know, clean the whole thing up and see what happens. And it's like, okay, that's not the right way to do things, but stranger things have happened and you, you, you try and work within the system because you realize that there's lots of things. There's intangibles. There are CEOs' personalities. You know, what is the strongest thing we look at and what is the strongest thing a, uh, a uh, VC that we know looks at? stick to -itiveness. How significant is the dedication that that CEO brings to the table? Are they willing to take a second mortgage or did they at some point in time? What are they looking at or are they just collecting a paycheck? Are they going through the motions? Going IPO? It depends a lot. I mean, there are certain sometimes to go IPO, there's sometimes to do a structured deal. You know, um, the disadvantages of going IPO are when you're a public company, as an analyst, in this industry, you have to write EPS estimates. What are EPS estimates when companies are six, seven years away from earnings, right? How does that really make a difference? It doesn't. But the realities are you're looking for gauges to measure. So should a company be public or should they be a sub or should they be privately held? It's another, it's, it's, it's a vehicle that you have to say, okay, how do you really want to measure that company? Who are the partners that are in there? Because chances are, if you've got really strong partners, the money is one thing, but their reputation is far, far more important. They want to be affiliated with winners because one winner breeds another winner, and they like to be able to go from victory to victory to victory. It's got to be a good story, you know, a good value proposition, good story. And, but we, we've seen early stage companies have some success there. I know a company that has a lot of presence here at the meeting, uh, Organovo, uh, went through that process this year and, and raised a lot of nice capital successfully. And they're arguably at an early stage. So we've seen it work not just for them, but some others. I guess, Fariba, have you, you must be presented with some of these types of investment you opportunities. Mean the reverse uh, reverse, reverse merger and being involved in those in those early finances. How 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 have you been looking at them and assessing them? I mean, we obviously look at 
both cases, both IPOs and reverse. I think, uh, I think maybe 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, reverse was somewhat of a taboo. I mean, you know, if you had a choice, you would always try to do a proper IPO. Obviously, if you could do with better banks or, you know, but, but that definitely was the preferred route. I, I think now we see much more reverse merger and some of them have become very successful. So, uh, you know, I think now uh, it's not as much of a taboo anymore. And uh, again, um, you know, we may not always come in right at that time of the, the reverse merger. Uh, because a lot of time, a lot of the valuation matrix are not yet settled at that, uh, at that time, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, some of the reverse measures have, you know, performed well, and we don't look at it as we looked negatively maybe 10 years ago or so. I think on the IPO front also, maybe it was always like that, but I have a feeling now it's even more that it's it's really becoming like a like a the I mean from a valuation standpoint, it's really I always joke I say it's like a Middle Eastern bazaar. I mean you come at the valuation here and it's almost always it comes half half of that valuation. So so kind of IPO and and I don't know for example the reverse. Uh, I haven't done that comparison to see when they do the reverse how the valuation compares to what originally they had in mind. Maybe because when they do the reverse, typically these are the smaller companies anyhow, so maybe it doesn't drop as much. But, but I, guess, I guess we can see that maybe from a company standpoint, IPOs sometimes are not as attractive anymore, or maybe if you look at the venture investors, because yeah, initially at least the prices are really cut in half, and uh, it's pretty brutal that process. So, so yeah, I mean, reverse definitely seems to be a way to go as well. Okay, and let's, let's come back and talk a little bit about sort of the success versus not success on that. But Paul, I want to let you comment. Have you, do you get involved in investing in, in those uh, types of really public transactions at all? Or? Uh, <coughs> I think there's a misconception that I think corporate venture capital prefers uh, private early stage companies, but that's not true. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, we did look at a uh, couple public opportunities in the space, uh, in the, the regenerative medicine space. Uh, I mean, I think for us, I think just going back to our sort of investment rationale, where we think we can leverage our strength, uh, that that really just drives us uh, investment decisions. Um, you know, I think to the point of uh, uh, what Steve was making earlier, um, the, I think the space is littered with companies that um, that needs to, you know, distinguish yourself. Um, uh, where we make, I think, that decision, you know, from a corporate standpoint, coming from non-healthcare background, coming from abroad, um, you know, I think we want to, you know, partner with companies that I think that brings that that intangible to uh, to play, which is, I think. That goes to the people, but not only the you know the type of the company, but the, the, the where the the people who are making up the uh, that company and also the story that they've been able to generate. Uh, I think that all goes into play much more so than you know where that technology lies or that product lies or development cycle is. Uh, I think we value that pretty highly. Uh, so. You know, <coughs> to to you know, to what extent do we value that kind of intangible uh, over, you know, what is quote quote sort of metric wise more measurable? Um, I would say we value that kind of intangible a lot more than than those metric side. But to what extent I can't really give you a number on that. Okay, but let's 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 go to the uh, to the value proposition a little bit or along these lines. What what do you think the value proposition of a company in this space? whether it's early, late, just within what you've seen, really needs to be that would cause investment to occur, whether it could be through some of these alternative sources like CIRM and, and some of the foundations or traditional public uh, investment funds um, to, um, uh, to companies like Baxter. What's, what, what would the value proposition need to be? Because I think that's from my standpoint, where, where this really begins. There has to be a reason why anybody's going to invest 
in what your company is going to be, whether it's going to be a short-term return, uh, a long-term uh, steady decline. There's got to be some good value proposition. And, and since I've moved over to the banking space, I'm really surprised at how many companies don't really offer a good value proposition out to investors. They don't spend time on that. And really articulating, you know, how we're going to grow this company. Not how big our markets are, not how big this is, but what I'm going to do with the money and how this is going to grow in value and really lay that out to whoever the investor is, whether it's a, a retail market investor, an institutional fund, a, a foundation. What are your thoughts on that? Because I've really been struck at how, how weak that often is from, from really good companies that have great technologies and great companies um, on how they present that to the investment markets. What, what do you see? What are your comments there? And I'll just let anybody. Well, I'll jump in, uh, Doug. I think, I think value proposition uh, is uh, in the eyes of the investor at, at various levels. So you start at the earliest possible stage and you say, what's the value proposition in order for me to capitalize this company? So oftentimes that value proposition is going to start with what it takes to get a, a federal research grant, right? To, to show proof of concept, to get a patent filed. So I'll go quickly through the stages here. But one of the things, if you do move science out of academia and into a company, which is a whole different conversation, I think way too many pieces of science get moved into companies versus don't have enough there to be a whole company unto itself. But if it does get moved into a company, then the value proposition needs to be to, the, to that early stage investment community. And one of the ways to bridge that gap are some of the things we've talked about. So um, strategic oriented investors, whether that's because there's a strategic fit with that fund's focus or whether it's a disease oriented group that says, yeah, I'll throw $100,000, I'll throw half throw a million dollars into this. That can be the kind of necessary capital to drive to the next point of value inflection or, or value perception that could bring in a, a, a more financially oriented investor. And that's one of the, the discriminating elements of, of this is discriminating between investors who are purely financially oriented, and I think those are increasingly disappearing, and where they do exist, you're competing with everything else out in the public markets, and, and this is public venture capital even at late stages of, of development, versus groups that have a strategic interest, even a, a mission, uh, an investment mission to be involved in a space. And that's probably the, the, the greatest area of bridging opportunities that this group has and, 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 then, and can use to get to the point where financial investors and then strategic investors, whether it's pharma or whatever, can see a sufficient value proposition in order to, to take a, a, a significant uh, participating role. So I view it in sort of a staircase kind of view. Um, if I would, you seem very, very pessimistic about the financial investors in the sector in biotech. Yeah, I from mean, the pure financial investors. You yeah. know, I have to say that um, I think biotech this year has done uh, has. tremendously well. I know that our fund has done extremely well, and uh, I think. Uh, you know, in terms of investing in public biotech companies, actually we find a lot of companies that are undervalued and offer tremendous value. Whether we see it as much in the stem cell area, that's one question. And you know, I would have to get more educated. Maybe, maybe there are opportunities that are missing there. But, but, but that's why I don't share that pessimism with you because I think, you know, we find all the time companies that have tremendous potential. And, and those uh, are, are market caps north of a half a billion, mm, north of a uh, billion? I would say our sweet spot is around the, uh, around 500 million, uh, but you know, we, we go and at what stage, the, you know, general stage of clinical development? You know, let's say phase two-ish, you know, we, you know, I mean, again, it also depends on the disease. For some diseases, even with phase one, you see proof of, uh, efficacy already even in yeah, small trial in, in some cases you can see it even in animals that is but but for some diseases you have to go further uh, into randomized phase two and right. so forth but but i would say our sweet spot is let's say between 200 to 500 million market cap but of course we go over a billion and we also go below 100 million depending on the circumstances right. and and you know 
And I'd say most uh, yeah, that that what I've observed over the last three four years in the public sector funds that the generalists are gone in terms of actually participating in these, and that there's a much smaller group of people who are doing in the below well, billion dollar right. groups. Um, and you know, and maybe, that's just maybe what I'm that's seeing. what is creating opportunity for sure. us. Because and, 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 we, oh, we are focused on healthcare, and we are focused in this area. Uh, I, I want to, you know, we do deals. We put books together. And they're, not all investors are created equal. There are some investors that are sticky, where you know that the securities are going to stay there. And there are some investors, well, they may be interested in just, ex, you know, they're, they're seeing some cheap stock, and they may be able to do what. So you've got to distinguish with who are your investors. You know, obviously not every investor can invest in a company that's got a $200 million market cap. They, they, you know, you call them up and you say, tell them, you know, call me up when they grow up to be a billion dollars and I'll put as much money as you want, because they just can't invest. But the idea is this, that those opportunities have to be me measured by the company and by the investment. So Daphna can go out there and be opportunistic and say, you know, hey, look, we can invest in whatever we want. I think what you might be looking at are the larger companies, that basically the larger investors. They, they have so much capital to commit, they don't have the ability to go out there. Or if they were to go out there, they would own 20% of the company you know, in just one offering, and sure. they can't do that. So um, you, know, you, you look at it and you say, I can remember a couple of transactions we did where our job wasn't to put investors in there. Our job was to throw people out. No, I don't want this investor because I don't really believe they're a real investor. I think there are going to be problems with them. The idea is it's a very, very tight dance that, you know, these institutions are making both, you know, in how long they invest, what their goals are, and um, who, who else they're investing with. Again, they want to see that they've got the right names there, too. Okay. Any other comments on, on this? We're starting to run a little, I'm sorry. Nope. Did, Go ahead. Paul? Um, why don't we just stop and see if there's any questions from anybody here for uh, anyone on the panel, and uh, we'll keep uh, keep moving along here. Any questions? Well, while we're thinking of that, we'll we'll we'll, we'll keep uh, pushing a little bit. Actually, I do have a question. How many people here are, uh, are run a biotech company? Just show hands. Okay, so it's about how many? Are, how many are private? Same, same population. Right? <laughs> no. mm -hmm. Number of them. How many are investors? Minority, OK. It's good to know your audience. OK. Well, let's, um, I guess um, I'm sort of caught with this feeling, too, and, and of, uh, I came back to, you know, we're not, venture capital, which used to drive this area, maybe isn't there. Um, companies. Um, are starting to come back in a little bit and recognize they're willing to get involved. We have two here, direct and in, indirect, I guess, uh, associated, um, and, and, and looking to understand how to, how to fund this, this space. I think, um, the, I think the, from my own perspective, I think the looking to the public markets is a viable, more viable than what I would have thought maybe a year or two years ago. I've seen good examples of companies being able to put together plans and working together to build um, the right base. And, and we're not talking about you know, obviously coming uh, public with a 200 or $500 million market cap. This is coming public with a, a 35 to $75 million market cap um, company. But that can, that can be put together. There are people who do want to invest in this space. In some ways, it's orchestrating how to enable that to happen. And then in, in doing so, where um, the company's not going to get funded and then, and then squalor and not, not be able to move, but be able to lay out to get ready for the next investment and the next, and, and being able to orchestrate that. So I, I mean, I can tell you from what I've seen, there's definitely, if you can put together the right plan, that value proposition of real growth, progressive growth, that goes beyond I've got cool technology, that there's, there's money out there and it's worth talking to people who can, can help you do that. And then I've seen um, funds uh, like uh, Fariba's and, and others who are interested to look to begin to get involved in, in those, uh, particularly if they don't have to drive it and be, the, and be the money at risk, but rather they can be a participant in it. 
And um, I think that's an area for this industry to, to keep trying to get organized around and learn how to do that better. And, you know, there have been a couple examples over the last couple of years of real successful markets. Not only did they raise money, but the investors are doing well. There's, 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 there's trading in the stock. There's, there's volume in the stock and, 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 and milestones coming that, that cause more and more interest. But, boy, you've, I think as we all know, um, you have, to, you have to sell a story, right? The world buys a story, and there has to be a good story, but with good performance around it. And I think uh, from industry to, and I think industry would welcome that, to see everything moving forward along with them to, uh, to funds, that um, it's definitely changing, but there is uh, good money available out there. Um, it just takes a little hard work to get to it. I think just one thing to add also in terms of that fundraising also, and I think bankers by and large do a good job on that, but the, still it's very important for a company uh, at whatever stage they are that when they raise money, they, 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 they know exactly where this money will take them to and the, the money should be sufficient to take them to the next level uh, to, so that the, there is another proof of uh, concept there or another uh, data point for the investors to look at and uh, you know to, to, to raise enough a month that you don't need to raise money just in the middle when there is nothing to look forward to yet uh. true completely so any other questions so I'd like to thank the panel for uh, <laughs> excellent participation thank you all <laughs>